Um, hello. Can you listen to me? Yes. Hi, I'm Hugo Merchant. I'm, I'm really happy uh, to be here and to present uh, Professor Lars Chipka from uh, his, uh, the Queen's Mary University of London. Um, so he's a super expert in bee behavior, and he has been uh, working with uh, you know, this subject for a long time. He has more than 300 papers published on this, and um, many, many citations, beautiful papers in very high-profile journals. And I met him, I, w I had the fortune to meet him in, in Ediche, in Sicily, where there is a an institute dedicated uh, on about talking about science. And that meeting was about compa comparative neurobiology of high order functions. And we have researchers, you know, working with bees, with uh, octopuses, with uh, bats, and with monkeys. And it was a, a very, very nice meeting because we covered a lot of ground. And I think we learned that it's very important to, to have an open mind about how, uh, which animal models uh, can be useful to understand different behaviors. And as you will see, Lars is a, is a, is a, a very imaginative uh, experimenter, and he has done beautiful work on how bees have cognitive abilities. So without uh, further, uh, I do, I will, I will give the um, microphone to Lars. All right, Hi. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for this very kind introduction and the invitation. Um, Hugo is right, you, the, the, the meeting in Erice did show that it's useful to keep an open mind. I think the most, the greatest idea we came up with was to form a band called the bees, the bats, and the mon monkeys. <laughs> because we discovered that several of, of us were also hobby musicians. But I promise we also got some science done, really. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess I owe you an explanation uh, why anyone would refer to the mind of an insect. I guess most of us might think by default insects are fairly pre-programmed machines that perhaps permanently reside in the present and certainly couldn't be said to have anything um, like a mind. But after researching bees' intelligence for about three decades now, I've now become presumptuous enough to claim just that, and I'll try to explain it a little bit in the, the coming hour. By the way, if I talk too fast, um, or you don't understand anything, just interrupt me and raise a hand. You're welcome to ask questions in Espanol, pero mi Espanol es muy mal. Entonces, you have to speak slowly, then I'll understand it. Muchas gracias. So, what I'll talk about today um, in is various facets of what animal psychologists talk about when referring to animal minds, irrespective of whether they research monkeys or corvid birds or insects as in my case. So I'll talk about representations of space and of things and of things in space. I'll explore um, in contrast to an hypothetical robotic animal that permanently resides in the present time, perhaps just responding to incoming stimuli by hardwired routines. I'll ask if bees have access to at least the immediate future and also the past, of course, whether they have flexible access to distant memories. And finally, and perhaps most controversially, I'll ask if bees could be said to have basic emotion-like states. Now, there is a, a general appreciation, I think, that some insects, social insects especially, can do very complex things. So we have here, side by side, the a result of a, a termite construction on the left and the La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona on the right. 
And superficially, at least, if you uh, um, set aside the scale factor, these are perhaps remotely similar constructions. But the thinking is, the common thinking, is that these come about by completely different pathways in insects on the one hand and in humans on the other hand. That is, in humans, there is a plan, there's an architect who dreams up the final result and then passes instructions, plans, to builders, to engineers, and so on, who put the entire plan into reality. Whereas on the other hand, so the thinking goes, there's no kind of planning in the insect case. The commonly uh, perceived scenario is that all of this apparent complexity arises from relatively simple behavior routines that each individual is already equipped with from birth, so to see, speak, and that as, an, as a result, an emergent property of all these simple interactions, complexity arises. And this dichotomy between the intelligent top-down processing and the human um, um, solution versus the bottom-up kind of processing that people think happens in insects is something that I want to deconstruct a little bit today. Now, the question of whether the complexity in insect architectures arises as a result of bottom-up or top-down processes is actually quite old. So this is a citation from a Swiss naturalist, Chardonnay, who, like many scholars, was fascinated by the regularity of, of honeycomb, the wax structure that honeybees build to store their larvae and eggs in, as well as their, their honey and pollen, of course. And it's indeed a highly regular structure. It's unparalleled in the animal kingdom, I think, in terms of its functionality and its regularity, and indeed its mathematical optimality in terms of minimalize, minimalizing material usage um, to generate the maximum amount of storage space, as well as stability and so on. No other animal builds anything like that. Ugo's monos don't. <laughs> um, nor do any kinds of, I mean, bird nests are animal architectures, but they're quite a messy affair in comparison. In any case, so Charles Bonnet said the following about how this kind of structure might come about. Placed together in the same room, 10,000 automatons animated with a living force and all induced through the perfect resemblance of their outer and inner being. If we admit the least degree of feeling in these automatons, even only such as is necessary for them to be conscious of their own existence, seek their own conservation, avoid noxious things, prepare useful things, etc., their work will not only be regular, well-proportioned, similar, equal, but it will also have symmetry, strength, convenience to the highest point of perfection. This is a curious mix, actually. Um, this is written over two centuries ago. He refers to the insects as automatons at an age when there weren't really many human-made automatons yet, but at the same time refers to them as conscious beings and somehow assumes that if you put, just put thousands of conscious beings together in a common space, then this kind of architecture will magically arise. Now, we now know that this is clearly um, incorrect. You can't put 10,000 fruit flies or chickens or zebrafish into a common room and somehow hope this kind of architecture will naturally emerge. So it takes a little bit more than that. So here's the honeybee building scenario. So this is an image from the, an ongoing construction of honeycomb and the natural building procedure invariably starts at the ceiling of a cavity or a beehive. In nature, it's a hollow tree. And then they gradually work their way down along gravity until they've reached uh, somewhere near the bottom. And François Hubert, another um, French, uh, Fris, French Swiss naturalist, um, explored experimentally, was the first to look at the inner workings of a beehive to find out how this construction might be undertaken. And the first thing that he discovered was when he replaced the wooden ceiling of the hive with a glass screen was that bees didn't like very much to attach their, the foundations of their comb to a slippery surface. 
And so what the bees did in that case is they just inverted the entire construction, started to build at the bottom, and gradually built their way up. And you might say, well, that still looks like a robotic activity. It's still the same kind of repetition of the same hexagonal shape. But my point here is an Ibert's point, I guess, as well, is that if you had actually built a machine to mimic a robot, to mimic the natural process, start at the top, use gravity as a reference, and build downwards, that robot would already fall on its nose with this simple challenge where you can't build your foundations at the top, right? So you'd have to add an additional routine, which would be simple to do if you did it, an instruction to your robot to if you can't use the, um, the, the ceiling as a, as a building foundation, then invert the whole reference to gravity. But the point is that you'd have to build this in, whereas a bee in its evolutionary history has never faced this kind of challenge before. Now, the next challenge that Hubert's team um, put in the way of the bee, they said, all right, now, if we make it a bit harder for the bees, we put in a glass ceiling and a glass floor now. And in that case, the bees started on one of the side walls and now built the whole construction laterally through the cavity of the hive box. But the most remarkable thing happened when after the construction had begun, so it's always by default a two-dimensional sheet, um, after this lateral construction had begun, the authors then put a, an obstacle, a glass screen, into the path of the ongoing construction. So on the wall that the bees would have reached with their construction several days later, they now put this, uh, this obstacle there. And what happened in that case was that rather the bees actually meeting the, the obstacle and then perhaps building some additional reinforcements, they anticipated the suboptimal outcome of their the, the um, dimensions of their architecture. So if we continue, we will in several days reach a slippery surface, and then um, turn the whole construction 90 degrees to reach the nearest wood wall, days before the suboptimal outcome would have been reached. And Hubert at the time explained, exclaimed that I could not, or I acknowledge that I could not suppress a sentiment of admiration for an action in which the brightest foresight was displayed. So he thought that the bees indeed there display a kind of planning ability where they anticipate a suboptimal outcome that would materialize some days in the future and took corrective action before that scenario was reached. Okay, so for the history lesson. Now to the kind of work that, that we've been doing over the last few decades. So most of our work on bees' cognitive abilities is outside the hive in the context of flower visitation. And it's useful to remind ourselves that there are a few key challenges that every bee has to face as um, a flower visitor. And the first, of course, is that bees are central place foragers. So they have a hive, they have a nest to which they must return. And that distinguishes them, of course, from all kinds of other animals that don't have a home to which um, they, they must in, in invariably find their way back. Because if a bee doesn't, if she fails, then she might die because most species of bees can't, um, the social bees at least, can't live on their own. Um, for the colony, if it's a large colony, the loss is relatively small, perhaps. But the vast majority of bee species are actually solitary. They're single mothers, so to speak. They're um, bees that build individually their own nest. And if they fail to find a way back to the location of their nest, all their offspring die. Okay? So the, the selection pressure for precise spatial memory is very high. In addition, of course, bees have to be careful shoppers in the flower supermarket. That is, they, have to, they might encounter several dozen different flower species in their flight range all of which might differ in their reward offerings, the quality and quantity of nectar, as well as um, of pollen. Nectar is the carbohydrate source that keeps the engine running. Pollen is a protein source, of course. And all these species, in addition to plant species, in addition to differing in their, the quality of the rewards they offer, 
they also differ in their advertising. So the most highly rewarding species in any bee's environment might be that blue flower here, and bees have to sample that, learn the signal, learn to associate, in this case, the blue signal with the reward, and then dedicate its foraging efforts to predominantly those plant species that have offered the, the best cost-benefit ratio. Right? And we, in a sense, simply capitalize on the bee's natural learning ability to associate almost anything with rewards. What we've done on the left here is a, an experiment where, this was actually a kind of fun experiment, where um, a bee learns the appearance of a human face. And you can see a little nectar droplet that's just sugar water on this little platform. And um, the bee lands there a few times, um, always in front of this uh, black and white image of a, of a human face. And then we, very much like in a crime witness test, present the bee with multiple faces, um, now without a reward, and the spatial um, arrangement is shuffled. And they're actually very good at subsequently locating the, the correct um, kind of, um, the correct face with about 80% probability. Much of my work, by the way, is entirely curiosity motivated. I have no association with engineering and so on. But curiously, after this study was published about two weeks later, I had this guy from the um, US military sitting in my office. This was the early 2000s, and they had like millions of funding to um, hunt Osama bin Laden and so on. And they wanted to somehow use the, um, the ability of bees to recognize faces to implement them on some um, sort of swarms of flying hand grenades and other crazy ideas. Anyway, I, I sent him home fairly quickly, but um, <laughs> it was a, a curious um, experience where um, someone thought my work has actually applied relevance for rather sinister solutions. Now back to the, the um, spatial orientation challenges. Now for anyone who's ever navigated a foreign city, where perhaps they couldn't read the signs. This is Shanghai, which I imagine many of you have not yet visited, but you might have had the, the challenge of navigating an unfamiliar city, city without, uh, perhaps your phone was out of charge and you couldn't uh, use any electronic aids, so you had to navigate on your own. And it's not an easy task, but it's made relatively easy in urban and human-made environments because all of these landmarks are made to be memorable. They're built to be unique, so they're easily memorable to use as navigation aids as well. Now, most of um, bees' environments, um, or many wild environments, are more like this. Okay, this is a, um, a landscape near Popocatépetl, and I've deliberately chosen a foggy day because this is actually quite con commonly what happens in mountainous areas that you can't actually see that far, and you can't also see the sun in this particular case. And I don't know if any of you do wild nature hiking, but um, the Chilangos regularly get lost in this forest and then need to be <laughs> recovered by the local authorities. Um, it, is, it is actually difficult because there are very few paths here, and, um, and um, you can't, often you can't see the sun, and when you're inside the trees, you often can't see the the hills, shapes, and so on. Yet it's a task that navigating animals that have a home base have to, have to solve every day. So you can imagine that your, your bee nest is under this tree or in this tree that you can just so make out, and there might be a good nectar um, source behind this hill over here and a good pollen source over here. Bees have to reliably navigate between these destinations, which take them often several kilometers away from their home base. And they're actually very, very good at these tasks. And the way we study bees' navigation is with this sort of equipment called harmonic radar, where essentially the bottom dish here emits a signal that's transposed to a different frequency by this uh, device here, a transponder on the bee's back, bounced back, and then um, picked up from the top dish on the right, and in this way we can track the bees' whereabouts while they're navigating in nature. And if we can track bees in three dimensions, that means we can not just figure out where they're actually um, spending their time and how, where they're looking for flowers and so on, 
but we can also take the, the view from the cockpit of the bee. We can actually e reconstruct what the bee sees while she's flying. So what you're seeing here, these boomerang shapes are a, a bee's eyes, basically, and the, um, the images inside the boomerangs are the scenery viewed through a bee's eyes. And you can see that the pixelation is quite uh, coarse-grained, so bees have less spatial resolution dictated by the optics of their compound eyes than, than we do. On the other hand, they can compensate for that by very rapid um, temporal sampling, so s small scanning movements and so on, which recover some of the detail that would otherwise be lost. Now, of the many tasks that we're setting the bees, and that bees actually have to master naturally is the traveling salesperson problem. And the, as the name suggests, I guess, that the, the idea is that you have to visit, if you're a traveling salesperson, multiple locations in the course of the day, perhaps, um, I don't know, multiple OXO stores in a particular part of town or some a, a bookstore in multiple um, different towns. And you want to do that in a way that minimizes travel distance and energy expenditure. And of course, bees face exactly the same problem because often they have to visit several locations in the course of a single flight um, and they have to minimize the, the um, energy expenditure. They are under pressure to economize their foraging, of course. So here's a simple version of this kind of traveling salesman problem with five locations. And, and down here is the hive. And you can see this uh, radar track here. Green is always early in these tracks, and orange is in the middle, and red is late. And um, this track clearly is not yet optimal, but that's because the bee is not yet very experienced. She has to discover these locations first. Here we're seeing several sequential tracks as the bee learns to memorize these locations and to find the optimal route. And you can see she's now uh, found four destinations. We, we're into the 10th flight now. She's now found the fifth, but you can still see there's quite a bit of exploration outside the area. She still try, tries to find alternative locations, but with time and experience, she gets better and better until in the end, she actually finds the optimal solution and, oops, and then sticks with a single path um, unless the, the array actually changes. Muchísimas gracias. The central complex. See, it's the central complex. It's an area where, well, as the name suggests, very much in the center of the, the insect brain. I'll show you an insect brain near the, the end of the talk, but yes, good question. Uh -huh. Now, what we're also interested in doing is leaving a bee entirely to its own devices and asking, okay, how would you like to organize your life? So this is now an unconstrained um, experiment, or just it's basically observational. We're just tracking a single bee's whole life uh, from the very first flight ever to her death, basically, a few weeks later. They only get to be a few weeks old, naturally. And so this is a bee's maiden flight, the first time she ever leaves the hive. In the center here is the, the home base, the, the, the nest. And you can see the bee explores in various directions, always coming back to the vicinity of her hive without entering it, then flying out in a different direction, exploring further. So there's a memory of where have I already explored? Let's try a different direction. And in that way, uh, in that way over a period of two hours, so this is sped up quite a bit, she actually navigates quite a bit, just exploring for um, spatial settings. There's very little... Uh, foraging going on during this um, early exploration. But one thing that will become relevant later is that during this first flight ever, she visits a flower patch in this forest edge up here. We'll come back to that in a few slides. So we're now starting on day two. The bee makes one more exploratory loop in a southwesterly direction, and now she's found something. 
And after she's discovered a good food source up here, a good flower patch, she actually does nothing but exploit that particular patch for several days. So we're following that bee um, all the time now, nonstop, for, for all of its life. And for several dozen foraging bouts and several days, in fact, it just visits like an assembly line worker, exploits just one patch and brings food back to the colony. Then after that, um, the bee was um, inside the, the nest for a few days because it was actually very rainy weather. And after this intermission of three days or two days, she visits this familiar patch for a few more day, um, flights. And then halfway on this outbound flight appears to change her mind and flies over to a destination that she had only visited once during the first flight of her life without retracing her steps back to the nest. There was a direct flight over there. Um, apparently recovering what for a bee at least is a distant memory from, um, from the first um, flight of her life and then spends the rest of her days just with, um, with this particular um, patch and in the end she just disappeared during a regular flight from the raider, presumably having been eaten by an insectivorous bird. But this kind of shortcutting along a way that the bee demonstrably had never flown before at least in the mammalian word, is used as evidence for cognitive mapping. Now, this is simply an observational work. It's not experimental, and we need more data, but it's suggestive in that direction. Now, when I discussed this kind of work with my um, colleagues who study primate cognition or clever corvid birds and so on, uh, they would always be a bit um, dismissive and say, well, yeah, of course, a bee has to learn spatial locations and flower colors and so on, because that was, that's what a bee does all the time. It's not an unusual thing for a bee to do that. And they said um, that, that, that um, the, uh, the deliberate approach that people use when they're testing the intelligence of sort of classical icons of animal intelligence is to face the animal with challenges that they've never encountered in nature before. And at the time, some of my colleagues were actually testing string pulling tasks in parrots and string pulling tasks are where you have to well pull on a string to retrieve a, a food item for example and here's an adaptation of that for the world of bumblebees I said at the time ah, I bet, I bet our bees can do that too and everyone laughed and thought Lars is crazy but we tried it anyway and um, so the idea here is there are three artificial flowers each attached to a string that's uh, just sticking out from underneath a plexiglass um, screen. The only way to get to the nectar in this central nectar well here is to pull on the flower. And this was um, Sylvain Alem's first bee that he trained with this task. There she goes. And you can see, number one, she's not just landing on the glass screen, she's actually landing in the correct place, and she's still a bit clumsy, it takes a while before they can actually do this proficiently, but she, in the end she gets there and pulls the string to get the, the flower out. And one way to train bees is to gradually push the, these artificial flowers under the screen. Another is to make them learn from each other, and that's what we're doing here. We have two bees, one marked with a red dot, um, that's an experienced bee, and the other is totally inexperienced. That's a naive bee that's never pulled a string before um, for reward. And now this naive bee is just scrounging on the efforts of the experienced bee, so she's just um, sharing the nectar in the end. But um, now they're getting a bit antsy because they've actually drunk up the nectar droplet. We always use small rewards so they don't easily satiate. And you can see now the experienced bee is running to the next flower, pulling the string there. This bee clearly has no idea yet what to do. She's still thinking, ah, there must be something there. But um, now in the end, she runs over again to the experienced individual and again shares the reward. But you do that a few more times. It depends on the bee. Um, so out of, <laughs> we, we had out of um, over 130 individuals, two that solved it with one trial, spontaneously. But the vast majority take um, about 10, 15 trials. Um, 
and, and, and some are so dense that they'd rather die than learn it. But, um, <laughs> but uh, there, there, so there's quite a bit of individual variation. So through this kind of social learning, the interaction of two, an experienced with an inter, uh, inexperienced individual, you can spread the skill, this unique skill of string pulling through an entire colony, basically like a, a social media meme spreads through a human social network. So what we've done here is we've arranged all the individuals in a colony in a circle. So each dot is one B. And at the top here, that's yellow 31. That's, that was the individual that solved the task the first. And you can see then that there are lines between these. That's every time there's an interaction between two Bs, a line forms. And once the target individual, the previously naive one, has learned it, um, that uh, dot turns colored. And you now see there's a whole bunch of orange bees here. These are all the individuals that learned it from the yellow bee. But by now, there is a purple bee down here. And it's, we've colored it purple because that bee has not learned the task from the original innovator, but from the second generation, from the orange bees. So there are several sequential sets of learners and demonstrators, as we call them, for this task. And in fact, the technique continues to spread through the colony even after this originally knowledgeable individual has died. Again, they only live for a few weeks, so that's a natural process. And if you train, if you have a colony with multiple string pullers, then you can get these um, wonderful scenarios where they almost seem to cooperate because there's this very strong attraction of bees to join other bees while they're um, pulling strings on that. But whether they're actually um, actively collaborating is still under investigation by my former postdoc, Oli Lukulam. Yes. Um, yeah, so there are also interactions when, within the nest, but they don't, um, they're not able to pass on these kinds of techniques to each other. So in bumblebees, for example, they can pass on the odor of uh, flowers that they've visited to other individuals. In honeybees, they can even communicate about the coordinates of the food source, the spatial position but they cannot pass on these kinds of um, operant procedures. Those they have to learn by actually being present at the setup. So they can't tell others that there is nectar there, but they have a general pheromone that they can spread in the nest, telling other individuals there's food out there, go and find it. Yeah, so it's a very general signal, not the specific technique. Ah, we can test that separately. So, of course, we can test and measure learning curves for individuals that learn the technique by themselves versus some that learn it from others. On average, the fastest learning is by observation from other experienced conspecifics rather than us training the bees. That takes longer, typically. We're not, we're not particularly popular role models for the bees, or not as much as, I guess, other bees. And, No, I think they're, in general, they tend to follow each other around. So other bees are always of some interest. Let's see what another bee does here. And then, of course, as a byproduct of that in this kind of task, that also incidentally brings a reward along. And then the observer goes, aha, this is interesting. Now what's that other bee actually doing to get the reward, right? No, they just, for starters, just look for other bees and see what they're, and, and then um, take note of what these other bees are actually doing. 
Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll skip some results because otherwise we might not get through the presentation. Um, for, for the next experiment, I'll let um, Jane Goodall do the introduction. She's a famous primate researcher for the younger generation. She's very familiar to my, my generation, but maybe not so much to the young ones. The most recent uh, example which blows people's minds is the bumblebee. And the bumblebee has been taught to roll a little ball he rolls it backwards, he rolls the little ball until he can push it down, or maybe she, I don't know, into a, a hole, like a goal. And as soon as this little ball gets into the goal, the bumblebee is given a little drop of nectar as a reward. So they learn to do this. But the mind-blowing thing is other bumblebees who've merely watched a taught bumblebee can do the same without being taught, just by watching. And that is supposed to be a mark of very superior intelligence. So this is something we're learning all the time. We have been far too arrogant. The animal kingdom of which we are a part is filled with secrets. And gosh, I'd love to be young and learning about these things now because all the doors are wide open and you never know what you're going to find. So this, for me, was very moving because Jane Goodall was one of my heroes when I was a young student of biology and was one of the inspirations for why, why I wanted to go into animal behavior in the first place. And for her to recognize our bee work and say, hey, I'd love to be young now and study bees was, was quite something. So let me explain this um, experiment in a bit more detail because it's quite important. So yeah, as, uh, Jane Goodall explained, the task here is to get this ball into a goal area. Um, and then if, if she's there, she gets a sugar water reward. But the social learning task that we're using here is actually a bit more difficult than that, uh, in that we've introduced a kind of trick into the interaction. You can see there are three balls here. And obviously, the optimal way of solving the task, if all you need to do is to get a ball to the center area, is to pick the closest ball. But this experienced bee here actually knows that that can't be done because she knows that this ball and that ball are glued down. They can't be moved. And the only one that's mobile is this one. And so when after she's learned this, then what she does is to um, roll this furthest ball. And the other bee, again, that's just a naive observer that's never rolled a ball for reward before. And in the end, uh, once the ball is in the right area, the, um, they both get a good um, reward of, of sugar water. The interesting thing now is, what does the um, observer do when she's put on the spot to solve the task herself? So if she was merely aping the demonstrator, just copying the action, that she's seen the demonstrator perform, that bee would be expected to, solve, to move the furthest ball because that's what the other bee did for getting a reward before. If, on the other hand, this bee has a form of understanding of the desired end product of the action, of the outcome, then she would be expected to move the closest ball. And that's exactly what they do most of the time. They don't copy what they've seen the demonstrator do. You can see she's quite clumsy because she's never had experience with rolling a ball for reward before. Um, but she, she does pick the closest ball and thus does, solves the task differently from what she's seen the demonstrator observe. How are we doing for time? All right, I think. So. We know that bees are good at recognizing flowers and patterns, but that, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that they actually have a, a virtual image floating around in their heads. It could be, and actually you know, computational neuroscience modeling shows that most flower recognition can be done with very simple feature detectors, edge detectors, um, spatial frequency detectors, color detectors, and so on. So we don't know from just the observation that they're finding the correct pattern that they can actually store mental 
um, images in their heads. But one way of asking this question in a slightly different way is if the animal has a representation of a pattern that is accessible from multiple sensory modalities. What we're doing here is we're making the bee learn one shape first by vision and then asking can they find the same thing by touch alone. So it's a little bit similar to the perhaps now historical um, children's birthday party game where you were blindfolded or you reached into a bag and you had to find an object that you'd previously only seen, such as a spoon or a screwdriver or a, or a key. So you have to have a mental representation of what that object shape is to find the correct object. And so the bees here learn through a plexiglass screen. They can't touch the object. So one group of bees rewarded on balls, the other on cubes. But this bee has learned a ball is rewarding. And we were then subsequently asking whether the bees that have been trained in this way can spontaneously find the balls using touch alone. So this is done under infrared light. They can't see um, under these conditions. And indeed, spontaneously, bees trained on balls will find the trend on seeing the visual stimulus of balls will spontaneously find them using their tactile sense and vice versa. So bees trained in the dark using their tactile sense um, to um, touch the balls and feel what's a, an edgy versus a round shape spontaneously find the correct shapes when they see them. So that indicates to us that indeed there is a kind of mental representation of object properties. Now, given all of this uh, work of bees with balls, it perhaps seems natural to ask, do they actually like playing with balls? And this was uh, what uh, Samadhi Galpayaga did for her PhD thesis. She um, now offered the bees these balls in the ab complete absence of any kinds of uh, rewards. Um, and indeed, these bees went out of their way to go to an area where they could uh, interact with these balls and then again and again um, in engaged with them and rolled them like in, in this kind of way. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, young bees appear to do this more than um, older bees and perhaps equally unsurprisingly, male bees did it a lot more than female bees. Um, you have to know that male bees are entirely useless. They don't perform any kind of... Uh, work for the colony and so seem to have plenty of leisure time on their hands. But I guess this observation that there is an inherent enjoyment of the activity without there being an appetitive reward um, brings us to the question of whether it's um, adequate to talk about simple emotion-like states in, in insects. And I would have probably ridiculed this uh, question until about 20 years ago, um, as would have everyone else. I mean, when I was a student, people did invasive electrophysiology and cats claiming that they don't have actually any sense of pain and so on. That's changed a little bit since, but let's have a look at bees. So this was an experiment we did 15 years ago um, to ask whether bees learn about predation threat. And um, so the, one of the natural contexts where that is relevant is um, with these crab spiders. These are spiders that, like a chameleon in some species, can adopt the color of the flower in which they hunt, and they simply sit and wait there for unassuming pollinating insects. And we took that situation into the laboratory with what we called our robotic crab spiders that uh, could actually briefly capture a bee between these sponge pads. And this is how that looks and sounds. So the bee is now landing on a safe flower, nothing happens. And now she's making a mistake, she's landing on a spider infested flower. So the, I, I assure you that the bee is physically unharmed, okay? So these are very sh soft sponges. So this is, um, it's the, the equivalent of an unsuccessful predator attempt where a spider might briefly capture the bee and then it escapes. And sure enough, the bees learned quite well to avoid the flowers with the spiders on with experience. But the more interesting thing was that their whole demeanor changed, that they would scan every flower extensively before um, landing on it and making a decision that the flower was safe. But more, more importantly, perhaps, 
they would display what we call false alarm visits all the time. That is, they would scan a perfectly safe flower that actually had no spider on it and then reject it as if they'd seen a ghost. And this to us at the time perhaps rather amusingly looked a bit like a, a human with a post-traumatic stress disorder, but at least we took it seriously enough to then explore the question more, more formally. And one way in which one can test um, emotion-like responses in other animals that's been well established is a version of the, the, the well-known, well, the proverbial question of whether your glass is half full or half empty. So you have an ambiguous stimulus that's a glass that's 50% filled, and an optimist might say, oh, this looks pretty good, there's still a lot in there, and continues to have a good time, whereas a pessimist might say, ah, oh, this is already almost empty, and become all sad about it. And so this paradigm in various versions has been used for domestic animals, for dogs, sheep, and uh, goats, and so on, to ask whether they're kept under conditions conducive to their well-being or not, as the case may be. And this is how we um, adapted this for, for bees. So there's a little flight arena here into which the um, bee can fly, and then there are um, these five little tunnels at the end where the bee can either get a reward or not. And in this case, for one group of bees, um, blue, if there's a blue signal on the left, there's always a reward, and a green signal on the right, there's never a reward. And the bee learns this, and we then ask, okay, how do you resp respond to ambiguous stimuli, like turquoise, that are in the middle between the two? And after training, after the bees learned this, you find that they will always respond in a very um, swift manner. If they see blue on the left, go there, there's a reward. If there's green on the right, they've already learned there's never anything there. So they'll faff about for minutes, and then finally, if nothing else is being offered, they will go, okay, well, I might as well try it after all. But it takes a long time before they're accepting the familiar but unrewarding stimulus. The question then is, what happens with um, the stimulus, the ambiguous stimulus, the one in the middle? And that's now the turquoise stimulus. And the interesting thing is that how bees respond to these ambiguous stimuli depends on what happened before they're actually being tested. And so what we did with some of the bees, but not all, is we gave them a little surprise reward before they even began the test. Um, whereas a control group did not get this reward. And so here's um, some data. Um, for the positive stimulus, that's blue on the left, the response time is always very fast. For the, green st the negative stimulus, green on the right in this particular scenario, the response is always slow. And the ambiguous stimuli, perhaps unsurprisingly, are responded to with intermediate um, times. But the interesting thing is what happens with those bees that had had this surprise reward, a little sugar droplet, before they started the test. And all of these bees, for all the ambiguous stimuli, that's our red curve here, will accept the ambiguous stimulus with greater readiness than the group that had not had this um, surprise reward. And it also turns out that this optimistic bias, as um, people call it, is dopamine dependent, as it is in, in rodents and us, of course. Um, it also turns out that you can shift the entire curve in the opposite direction if you give the bees a simulated predator attempt before they're starting the test. So this is an experiment by Jerry Wright, um, who found that you can shift the entire curve towards longer values if the bees have an expectation, okay, the ambiguous stimulus might potentially be um, something nasty. So just he here's my promised overview of the bee's brain. Actually, this doesn't have the cent central complex. Sorry, you will. <laughs> I'll show you the central complex later. But this is a frontal view of, um, of a bee's brain. These um, um, blue shaded area are the, um, the visual ganglia that are uh, uh, processing information from the eyes. This old-fashioned sort of telephone dial arrangement here is the antennal lobe that receives chemi chemosensory information. Both of these areas send information to the so-called mushroom bodies, which is centers of uh, learning and memory, as well as multisensory 
integration. The central complex would be around here. That's the navigation area. Now, the number of neurons is, in a sense, diminutively small compared to, let's say, a rodent or let alone a human brain. So a bee has, honeybee has under a million neurons. And that might perhaps um, mislead us to think that their brains are relatively simple until we look at the structure of an individual insect or bee neuron. This is one cell here. It turns out that this is actually uh, the single cell that uh, underpins a bee's reward pathway. Uh, so this cell tells the whole brain there's, there's been a nice sugar reward. And you can see that there are ramifications through the entire brain, including mushroom bodies and all parts of the, sorry, the internal lobes and all parts of the mushroom bodies. That individual neuron is as finely branched as a fully grown tree, albeit miniaturized, of course. And um, this complexity of bees' brains, of course, has been recognized long ago. Here's another single neuron in the visual system. There are more different neuron types in a fly or bee's visual system than there are in the human retina. Okay? So the idea that you have fewer neurons but less complexity is, is clearly not borne out by reality. And this complexity was recognized by one of the, the founding father, fathers of neuroscience, Ram, Ramon y Cajal. Um, this, by the way, is a drawing of the bee visual system with several identified neuron types that's um, over, a cent, over a hundred years old. It's a beautiful drawing with all these um, individual these stained neurons and so on. I'll try my best to read this in Spanish. You're not allowed to laugh because my Spanish is, is really bad. Um, but I couldn't read it in English because that would be a bit silly. Poseen estos animales un sistema nervioso extraordinariamente complejo y diferenciado y de una finura constructiva que raya en los límites de lo ultramicoscópico. Compararos los ganglios visuales y cebroide de una abeja o de una caballito del diablo, con los de un pez o de un anfibio, experimentase una sorpresa extraordinaria. La excelencia de la máquina psíquica no aumenta con la jerarquía zoológica. Antes bien, se reconoce que en los peces y anfibios, los centros nerviosos han sufrido inesperada simplificación. Ciertamente, la sustancia gris ha crecido considerablemente en masa, pero cuando se compara su estructura con la del cerebro de los apiros y libelulios, se nos aparece como algo excesivamente grosero, vasto y rudimentario. Es como si pretendiéramos igualar el mérito del tosco reloj de pared con el de una seboneta, maravilla de finura, delicas, delicadeza y precisión. Como siempre, el genio de la vida al construir sus obras portentosas, brilla en lo pequeño mucho más aún que en lo grande. It's beautiful. Anyway, so some take home messages here. Um, I think we have considerable evidence that bees have representations of space and of things and of things in space, that they also display at least simple tool use, object manipulations, with a kind of awareness of the desirable outcome. And hence, of course, this is something achieved not by trial and error, but some sort of mental exp exploration, because they can actually solve several of these tasks spontaneously. And at least by the same criteria that are used for domestic mammals, for example, we're not lowering the bar, they could be said to have um, simple emotional states. And I think these are key ingredients of an animal mind, however different that mind may be. And that in turn, I think, um, places on us some onus, some um, obligation to conserve the environments that have generated these unique minds. I think people are aware nowadays that we need to conserve bees because they do useful things for us humans via pollin pollinating our crops and wildflowers and so on. But that's an approach of utility. We conserve them because we need them. But what I'm trying to get across is that we also should conserve them because of, out of respect for their um, unique intelligence and minds. And I'll stop here and thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Ah, yes, so I'm super excited because I just have um, published my first book and I've distributed these postcards because if you look on the back there's a code and you can actually get it cheaper directly from the publisher if you're interested. Um, so the book covers the territory that I've just spoken about in much greater detail, including a lot of the historical dimensions of this science. Thank you. So you, um, you might have been aware of the fact that they just released the Drosophila larva connectome. Uh, that uh, you might have been aware that they um, just released about a week ago or so the Drosophila larva connectome, which is quite an amazing feat. Um, it's about 3,016 neurons and about uh, over a half a million synapses. So I think that just puts into perspective larvae. As you know, flies are able to do a lot of things. They can learn, they can you know, perform a lot of different behavioral tasks. And I guess this will actually just usher in a new era of um, neurobiology. I don't know what you think. I'm very excited by this, of course, because one of the, the very reasons why we study insects, I think, is to some extent the prov promise that we might actually understand neural system function comprehensively sooner than we might in an animal that has multiple log units, more neurons, of course. Um, so the promise is there. Um, of course, the Drosophila larvae is even compared to the fruit fly, the adult fruit fly, still a relatively simple animal. Um, but the, the, the efforts are, I mean, the, I think by now, about 20% of the adult fruit flies um, circuitry is also, um, th there, 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 there is a connectome. Now there's still many details, of course, that we don't know yet. So even if you know cell A is connected to cell B, you don't necessarily know which synaps synapses are excitatory and inhibitory, which ones are plastic, which ones aren't. But yeah, so the, the, the promise of getting an entire circuit diagram for something like a bee and understanding how this amazing diversity of innate behaviors plus cognitive abilities gets, me gets mediated by perhaps a relatively small uh, number of neurons is, is, an, is a very exciting perspective, of course. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I have a couple of questions. I'm going to ask them from the least silly to the most silly. Uh, first one. I assume that all these uh, evidence that you show us are from worker bees. Are there any difference in performance if we experiment with queen bees or drones? It's a good question. And many people have for decades always thought that um, the male bees must be very stupid because they don't actually deliver much work. So we haven't tested the male bees formally with many of the more advanced tasks that have shown um, for, for the simple reason that male bees are harder to experiment with. Mm. And the reason is that the unique advantage that we have with worker bees is that they never satiate. Because when they're full, they go back to the colony, unload the food and come right back to our setup. Whereas a male bee is full, she'll go to sleep and she'll sit in the corner and say, thank you very much, I'm done with your experiment. Okay. But for the experiments that we have, D uh, quantitative comparisons for, for example, color learning and reversal learning, surprisingly the males are as good as the, the female worker bees. And I've tried the string pulling task with, with male bees as well, and they could do it too. They're a little bit slower, um, but, and I haven't formally done the statistics yet, but they can do it. Okay. And the other question. So you mentioned that uh, bees can learn uh, task that result in a reward. And also there's a probability that bees uh, play. Uh, could, be, could, be, could we combine those two things? Like have bees perform a play-like activity uh, in a way that they receive a, a reward? What I'm asking is, can we teach bees sports? Can we make like bees play football or soccer? 
Well, you, you, this is, uh, we, we actually did, yes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, once we had some um, bees that were trained to get food into certain locations, we actually had a little, this was actually for a television um, visit to the team, we actually painted a little ball like a football and trained a group of bees to get into a goal area, which was very amusing to see. Um, they might in the end be better than the England team, but, um, <laughs> but yes, so the, the, the task is essentially the same. It's to, to manipulate that object that is the ball into a target area. Okay. And there is footage on YouTube. If you um, send me an email, I can send it to you of bees rolling a tiny football into a goal area. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was right. an awesome presentation. Hi. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. It was wonderful. And my question is, uh, all the examples that you show, uh, except for the first, were on the individual level, like bees learning something, individual bees. But the first example that you show is a, a collective work from, from, the, from the whole colony. But we don't, so for me, as a neuroscientist from the rodent world, like it's understandable at the individuals, right? Like these capacities of navigation and stuff. But the collective work, do you know anything about the mechanisms uh, behind that? Not yet. It's a very good question. Um, the work that I showed, of course, is two centuries old. And um, the images were simply drawn from the description of this historical literature. Um, we would, of course, love to know who in this um, building scenario where you have to anticipate a future challenge, who does the scouting, who finds out whether the target wall um, is optimal or suboptimal, how this message is related back to the other individuals that do the building, and how they decide collectively on altering the structure in one particular direction. Because if everyone individually alters something, you'd end up with a huge mess. So we don't know this, and of course many of these experiments should be redone with modern camera equipment and marked individuals where you can trace what task each individual takes on. But yes, it's a fascinating question. And the other one is a bit related, which is, so if you take together these abilities of individual bees, so what is the variability, the variability in between, among individuals? Like, is all the bees do more or less the same, or there are some bees that are better for, for this or other things? Have you studied that? Yes. So for every psychological trait that you test, if you do it rigorously for individuals over multiple different contexts, you find consistency and variation between individuals. So this is apparent with simple tasks like associative learning colors or odors with rewards where you can measure each individual's learning curve for a variety of different colors or odors and you find that they, some individuals that are fast at learning, let's say one order will also be fast at other orders and indeed they are, there's consistency across sensory modalities even. So faster learners appear to be fast with everything. We then wondered maybe per perhaps individuals that generate associations faster or slower at undoing them but it turns out that the faster learners are also better at reversal learning. And so we find this individual variation also with the more cognitively demanding tasks as I mentioned earlier. Some of our um, over 100 individuals in the initial string pulling study just managed it spontaneously. Others need this uh, social learning or, or stepwise training and so on. And there are always, with each task that we test there are some individuals that solve something in entirely unexpected ways completely different from all other individuals so i can give you one example where we um, measured foraging efficiency of bees we wanted to find out whether faster learners also forage more nectar per unit time and so we let the bees fly freely and captured them every time they departed weighed them and weighed them again when they returned and the weight difference then is foraging efficiency and the bees typically by default don't like being captured, although most of them get used to it over time. But we had one individual that would actually fly directly into the container every time when she came back, basically using it as a kind of public transport back to the nest. So she inspected us to transport it in that container to put it back into the nest. One individual out of hundreds.
Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, that was very interesting. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, so, all the exploration is made on the maiden flight? Or do they go further after? So I'm not sure if I understood the question. So the, the radar equipment that we're using allows us to track the bees for about up to one kilometer. And that captures a substantial fraction of the bees' movements, but there are individual bees that will go further depending on how much uh, floral resources there are in the vicinity. And in fact, in the case of honeybees, for example, they can fly over 10 kilometers from their hive. And with our equipment, we cannot track them yet for such distances. Okay. Does, uh, was that your question? Yeah, yeah sort of. Okay. Uh, another question would be if, the, if you have the stats on the proportion of bees that are more adventurous versus others that maybe are just conservative and go to the same place? Yes, so with these um, radar tracking studies where we're looking at individual bees' lives over the entire career, so to speak, Indeed, some individuals are much more exploratory than the one that I've shown you. So that one basically explored on its first flight and subsequently only um, exploited familiar patches and nothing else. Other individuals have a mix of both, so they will intermittently switch back to a phase of exploration and then find new resources, and others explore their whole life. So we call them our hippie bees that never settle down on anything and always try novel resources or try to just search for something else that they haven't found yet. Um, and do you know how could that Im influence the thriving of the column? So I guess the, um, the, to have a good mix of individuals with different individual strategies is beneficial depending on what the current situation is. So if you have a situation of relative stability where floral resources um, are available continuously for um, weeks or longer, you, you don't need to interface exploration repeatedly with exploitation. But in situations where the environment changes, which is often the case, even if the flowers are stable, then some patches might be exploited by the competition. And in that case, of course, having explorer bees, those that dedicate more time deliberately to information acquisition rather than just resource acquisition, becomes beneficial as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, then let me tell you why I ask about the interactions in the nest. In, in, in rodents, it is very well known that there is a social transmission of food preference. Uh -huh. So I was thinking if uh, this phenomenon can be also observed in bees, and that will change the motivation of the learner to follow the actions of the presenter. Yes, so the, the social learning as it happens in rodents, of course, is often by chemosensory cues. Exactly. So that a palatable food that is brought back on the breath of, say, the mother of a, um, a, a, a family of pups, they will sniff her breath and subsequently come to know, aha, that's, uh, that's food that isn't poisonous and, and I can eat the same as well. Now, in the kinds of experiments that are showed here, we make a very deliberate effort to eliminate odor cues because we want them to, for it, to concentrate on the techniques. But if you allow the exchange of odors, and of course, for example, flowers, different flower species have very different and distinct scents, then indeed these scents are passed on inside the colony and are presented to other individuals jointly with the nectar reward that's also brought back. And in that way, quite similarly to rat pups, other bees inside the colony can pick up the correct scent of a flower that's currently being exploited. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, a bee that has, has eaten some uh, nectar is able to secrete some pheromones 
in response of changes in their metabolism and give the signal that they're pretty much satiated or be, being able to, to eat and, and provide that signal to their partners in the, in the nest. So there are, yes is the answer. So there, there are two distinct kinds of chemical bits of information. So a bee that comes back from a flower patch that she's found rewarding will emit a pheromone that has no specificity of the particular flower that's been visited. It just tells other, so we're talking about bumblebees in this case, it just tells other bees there's good food out there, go and find it yourself. But in addition, there is a spe specific information simply because the bee that has visited these flowers has the scent adhering both to her fur as well as to the nectar or pollen that she's bringing back. And so the, the other bees in the hive basically combine both bits of information. They get the general signal, aha, uh -huh, someone says there's going to be food out there, what does it smell like? And they get the smell from the nectar that's brought back as well as the scent that adheres to the bee's fur. In honeybees, of course, as opposed to um, bumblebees, in addition to this, there's the dance. There's this yeah. symbolic code that also transmits the precise coordinates of a food source to other bees inside the hive. But that's unique to honeybees. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, I want to thank you for that beautiful talk. You know, amazing work. Thank you. I have one, one question. Uh, I gather that these bees learn quite fast. The question is, do they forget? Or do you, do you see extinction when you remove uh, the reinforcer? Yes. So if if we change the contingencies between the, the connection between rewards and sensory stimuli like colors and scents, then they quite quickly relearn. If we just remove the rewards, we do see extinction, but very little. We don't actually have any evidence that they completely ever forget anything. Now, they only live a few weeks, um, so the duration over which they retain memories need to retain memories is relatively short if you compare to primates or rodents and so on. But if, for example, we, we retest them after an interruption of several weeks um, on things that they had learned earlier, there's clearly some decay. So they're not as good as at the end of training, but they're also not as bad as at the start of training. So there seems to be some retention even in the event of completely reversing associations or giving no rewards for some time in association with certain previously learned stimuli. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I, I have two questions that arrived by YouTube. The first one, what is more important in the emergence of mind, the connectivity or the number of neurons? I don't know is the honest answer. I wish I knew. Um, I suspect that the, the number of neurons um, is the more neurons you have, the more you can do with them, but I suspect that it's not a very critical determinant. So if, um, if you look at the um, nervous system that controls, the, the, the part of our nervous system that controls our gut movements and digestion and so on, um, then that has a lot more neurons than, um, than a bee, for example. But the connectivity, I suspect, does not actually, the, of these numbers, if these neurons, even though there are many of them, I think it has the enteric nervous system has about a billion neurons, of course, does not generate a mind. So you need a good number of neurons and the right kind of connectivity is my, my suspect, suspicion. I mean, of course, we, um, we don't know the neural substrate of consciousness or a mind in any organism. There are correlates, there are certain areas that are required, but which precise connectivity you actually need, no one knows either in bees or other animals. But yes, I think the, the secret is in the connectivity, not just the numbers of cells. Thank you. <clears throat> the second one. Can 
can anomalous moisture and air humidity interfere the chemical cues used by bees to, com to communicate? I suspect that the answer is yes, um, but we haven't tested that. Um, so I mean, I think in all, in all chemical communication, you're very vulnerable in a sense to all kinds of interference. So it depends, the, the, the way in which odor spread depends on the prevailing wind direction. It depends, as you say, on humidity and so on. So I think it's likely that there, there are influences I mean, one thing that comes to mind is that um, bees, actually, honeybees, for example, make very um, organized efforts to keep the humidity inside the hive at a relatively constant level. And, for example, if the hive gets too hot, they'll bring in extra humidity that is used for, that, that, that spread on the comb, and then um, they fan their wings to generate um, um, coolness and so on. So there, there is some control of the humidity also in, in a colony. But yes, I suspect that there is interaction also with pheromone communication. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for, hello. Thank you very much for an extraordinary talk. A question about uh, the Varroa problem. Um, so the Asian honeybee has this cleaning behavior that can get rid of the parasite. So do you think this could be taught to the Western honeybee somehow? Could this cleaning behavior of the comb be uh, somehow transmitted by humans or by using the other species? Yeah, that's a very good question that of course interests lots of beekeepers. Um, a technical challenge of course there is the logistics of doing such an experiment because the emergence of the varroa mite in Western honeybees is precisely because of the careless mixing of um, Western and, and Eastern honeybees. Um, and so there's now a lot of legislation in place to not move bees randomly around the planet. In principle, yes, um, we've asked ourselves the very same question, but getting the two to interact under conditions that minimize the spread of further parasites um, is of course tricky. Um, so that's the concern. But in principle, I don't see why it should not work. Thank you. Thank you. Last question? Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk so much. Um, my question has to do with the experiments you've done uh, on the multisensory processing where you taught bees to recognize uh, balls or cubes. Uh -huh. um, so you did it under visible light and I was wondering whether you considered um, taking the UV light because I saw an experiment with butterflies that they could recognize apparently spiders that were waiting for them in the flowers uh, because of uh, UV light reflection. Mm -hmm. I w because the, 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 the retinal neurons are so complex so I was I, I don't know anything about bees, if they only see in the vis visual light uh, range or maybe further, because they seem to be able to do quite a lot, lot of things. Yeah, so bees are trichromatic like us, um, but their whole visual spectrum is shifted to shorter wavelengths, so they can see ultraviolet light. Um, they're less good at the long wave end of the spectrum, so they cannot see red light as well as we can, or in fact as but butterflies can, because many species of butterflies have the whole spectrum from the ultraviolet to the red, right? So um, in our cross-model experiment, the visual environment contained ultraviolet, because we tried to keep the lighting conditions in the lab as natural as possible. But in the darkness conditions, those were filmed unfer under infrared. Mm -hmm. So that's a range that, to which both we humans as well as um, bees are entirely insensitive. There are some insects, so-called fire beetles, that actually can see infrared light. And they can do that because they lay their eggs on freshly burnt um, wood 
um, so that they actually they need to detect forest fires from a distance so they can actually see them from more than 30 kilometers away. But that's unique to these fire beetles among the insects and our, our, our bees can't see infrared. Okay, thank you and good luck with your book. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Lars. Muchas gracias.